So predictive algorithms, as we know, more and are everywhere and are increasingly influential uh, in more and more critical areas of our lives, from who we marry um, to what kind of medical treatment uh, we are given. And there are a lot of benefits that come from predictive algorithms, uh, but there are also a lot of very serious concerns that I want to talk about today. So it seems like every day we're finding or we're hearing about a new place where um, well-intentioned or not so well-intentioned prediction uh, is going wrong. And many of those concerns have to do with fairness and in particular with discrimination. Fairness can mean different things. Discrimination can also mean different things. The concerns, many of them are about uh, discrimination. So the point is that these algorithms are running on a certain population in a certain context with a certain history and socioeconomic, um, in a so certain socioeconomic setting, the population includes minorities that are protected by law, policy, ethics, and they are, or the concern is that they are mistreated or could be mistreated or could experience adverse outcomes from these automated predictions. Now, fairness is not a new question. It's a very old question, millennia old. Uh, and it's not a computer science question. Many fields have considered fairness. What is new um, is you know, the setting we're talking about and the nature of these systems that are operating at scales and on data and on richness of data that was previously unimaginable. And so computer science uh, is playing an integral role and hopefully can also play an integral role in mitigating or um, resolving some of these issues and concerns. Okay, now I think it's sort of hard to say this anymore with a straight face, but I do want to say it that initially there was maybe some hope that the algorithms would be benevolent and unbiased and make equitable decisions for us. But this hope, you know, is very naive and is dashed time and again, you know, by the fact that the algorithms are trained on biased data. They um, are trained on features that could be selected in a certain way. They're trained with a certain objective in mind. And the algorithms themselves, as we will see, could be introducing, could be exacerbating the problem. Nonetheless, our hope is to come up with a theory of algorithmic fairness or a computer science theory of algorithmic fairness, to come up with definitions of fairness and um, with algorithms that meet those definitions and give um, strong guarantees. So coming at this as a theoretical computer scientist, the hope is to have a, this whole holy grail, a mathematical definition of what it means for an algorithm to be fair, and then to construct fair algorithms uh, that would let us get all of the benefits of data science and automated data, automated analysis and machine learning without all of the harms of discrimination and other harms we, we might worry about. So I think, I'll try to be static. Uh, it's not easy for me, but I'll try. So, uh, yeah, I think this is a great goal. I think, as Cynthia said yesterday, fairness is really hard. It's a hard problem, even for those of us who have been working in cryptography and privacy, and are used to sort of treading this line between um, kind of a social, concern or problem and formalizing it in the language of math. And the reason is that fairness you know, is very subtle, it's very context dependent, it changes you know, from one setting to the other, um, you know, it changes in terms, of what, you know, in terms of what's in the data and what's in the features. It's very hard to come up with one definition um, that is just the definition of fairness. I think we are doing well in cataloging evils, so actually pinning down what we mean by c different concerns about discrimination, you know, like, thing, like X is bad and Y is bad, these are things we don't want to happen. We're still definitely not at an all-encompassing definition of fairness, but I think we do have a very promising research program based on the history of success in cryptography and in private data analysis of identifying and formalizing these evils or concerns, things that are going wrong, and then coming up with definitions and with countermeasures for counteracting them. And we don't need to end up with one definition in order to have a successful research program. So that's my perspective on the theory of algorithmic fairness. I want to talk about a specific line of work today in uh, risk prediction. So let me tell you a little bit about the setting and then we'll talk about multi-group um, fairness. 
Good, so risk predictors assign probabilities to individual events. So for example, predicting the probability of rain on a certain day, the probability that individual X will repay a loan if we give it to them, the probability that this tumor, you know, perhaps we're looking at imaging, the probability that this tumor, based on these features, will become cancerous, um, the probability that a defendant will commit, um, this defendant will commit a violent crime if they are released on bail, if they are released. So, as you can see in these examples, these uh, predictions of risk can have very far-reaching consequences for individuals. And we need to take a lot of care when we're trying to predict these probabilities. And right off the bat, I want to say that once we are talking about these as probabilities, you, know, you might say this doesn't make sense. And that what's the probability space? And in particular, if we're talking about a non-repeatable event, what does its probability mean? Either the loan will be repaid or it will not. The tumor will either metastasize or it will not. We don't get to observe many trials and, you know, and talk meaningfully about a probability. And this is an age-old question. Uh, the meaning of individual probabilities in statistics, um, in operations research, and we won't resolve it today, but I think we will give um, a new perspective about how to give probabilities that are meaningful in a new way or in a certain way. Okay, so I'll try not to have too much uh, math, but I still think we have to do some bare basics. So what is the setting we are talking about? We have an individual, we have a distribution an underlying distribution over individuals with certain features, those are X, and outcomes that they will see, Y. So X could be financial history uh, features and Y, whether you know, this loan applicant repays the loan or not. And now, once we have this underlying distribution, we can talk about or we can imagine the true probability that an individual X will repay the loan. The true probability, according to this underlying distribution, that the outcome will be one. And I want to say this is mathematically well-defined. Of course, we can never get our hands on it. It's out of reach for us because the person either repays the loan or they don't. We, don't, we just get to see one outcome. We don't know whether it was a 50-50 probability or the outcome was always preordained. Okay? Nonetheless, this is what we're aiming for. This is what we have in our mind as our goal. Right? What we want to do when we're doing automated risk prediction or we're doing risk prediction, we want, given the features X, given a new individual, we want to predict this probability um, that their outcome will be one. And an increasingly um, popular way to do that is by using machine learning, using a learning algorithm, this a sausage grinder in the image. So what we do is we take a sample of historical data drawn from the underlying distribution, so multiple, many, many instances, in fact, a huge number of instances, if we're talking about modern machine learning, of labeled examples. And the algorithm tries to output for us a risk predictor. That's going to be P tilde in my talk today. So P star is the correct probability. P tilde is the algorithm's estimate for these correct probabilities. And we're trying to do as well as we can. Okay, so the learning algorithm is trying to learn this risk predictor um, P tilde. And as I said, the correct probabilities are out of reach. Right? We don't even know whether you know, the universe is deterministic or probabilities truly exist. So we can never really come close, or we certainly can't prove that we come close to P star for complex questions like predicting the risk of a heart attack or cancer or loan repayment. Um, so Errors are inevitable. Okay. That's a, an important point to uh, have in mind when you're talking about uh, machine learning and when you're talking about risk prediction in general. And there are a lot of concerns about where, who these errors impact and how they impact and how they impact those people. And these, many of these concerns are about fairness. So when we're talking about fairness in machine learning, I like this quote. It's maybe too pessimistic um, a perspective to lead with, but I do like the quote, right? So the point of this quote, that machine learning is money laundering for bias, for bias, is that all the biases that are in the data, these labeled examples, historical data that are coming into the algorithm, might be reflected in the output of the algorithm. Okay. So there are biases in the data, and I said before, they could be in terms of the outcomes that a protected group has experienced over time. They could be in terms of representation. 
in the data. They could be in the features that are chosen. Okay, maybe the features uh, are informative for some individuals, but not for the protected group we're talking about. Um, they could be in the objective function that is being optimized. What is the algorithm being optimized to, to do? And there, are further bias, and there are further biases that could be introduced by the algorithm itself. Okay, so machine learning algorithms aim often for simplicity. That's an important goal because simplicity lets us generalize to unseen examples. So if some protected set is, say, on average, more likely to default on the loan, the machine learning algorithm could very well just give up on the protected set in the, uh, entirely in the goal of being simple and in the goal of um, optimizing its behavior elsewhere okay, to get lower error um, on other populations. So I think I definitely want to have this concern in mind that the algorithm might not be accurately reflecting what's going on in the data itself. So the algorithm itself might be missing what's going on for protected groups in the data. I will also say a few words on some of these biases in the data itself, um, and I think the machinery has something to say about those. Okay, so this is our concern, and how will we deal with it? So there are various notions of fairness in the literature. I think the early ones focus on group fairness notions. And here we have a single protected group in mind. And the definition or the goal or the um, regulation is to force the predictor to behave similarly in different ways. Behave similarly could mean different things, and we'll talk about that in a minute, on the protected group S that we have in mind and on the general population T. Okay. And behave similarly could mean different things. It could mean that we are actually forcing the predictions to be similar. Okay, so we're actually forcing similar fractions of the individuals in S and T to get certain predictions of uh, certain levels of risk prediction. Um, or, you know, and this could be appropriate when you think there are there shouldn't be inherent differences in outcomes between groups. But even if we do think that there should be differences in outcomes between S and T we can require that the predictor is similarly accurate. And we have various accuracy notions that we can try to equalize. In the talk today, I want to focus on calibration. And I'll define what that is. It's an accuracy-based, it's, it's a notion that's geared towards accuracy of predictions. Um, and I'll define it uh, in a couple of slides. So this is group, this is uh, group fairness. And there are a lot of issues with it. One issue is that it's very weak. It's only looking at what's happening on the entire group in aggregate. And that could be really missing the behavior on important subpopulations. The predictor could be very uninformative um, on some members of the group, and still in aggregate, it would pass these weak tests. Moreover, some of these notions, even though they all seem to make sense, like similar false positive and negative rates and calibration, both notions that seem geared towards accurate predictions, are completely at odds with each other, so you can't uh, get them, you can't get both equalized, uh, both balance and calibration. Uh, this is work of Choldakova and um, Kleinberg, Mulinathan, and Raghavan. And even if we were happy with this notion of group fairness, what's the group, right? Especially thinking about, from an intersectionality perspective, thinking about uh, what we heard about yesterday, there isn't just one monolithic group that we are trying to protect. The data are very rich. The context in which they are being used um, are life-altering. And you know, who is this single protected group S? It doesn't exist. There are many groups we need to think about. And that's a big problem. So which groups should we protect? And that's also where our uh, perspective comes in. So the first thing to bear in mind, the group notion might not protect subgroups. And I love this example from work of Cynthia et al. Um, on a steakhouse, that, it, that the example uh, demonstrates the weakness of group fairness. So we have a steakhouse, and the steakhouse is um, racist. It's biased against members of the group S. So they really, really don't want members of group S to show up at the steakhouse. However, they do want to advertise. They want customers. And suppose we lived in a world where there was some regulation, and they weren't allowed to just advertise to people who are not an S. So what is a racist steakhouse owner to do? Well, advertise to, say, 5% of the general population and to the vegetarians in S. Okay, so 
which say are 5%. So you've equalized your rates of advertising between S and the general population, but of course, this is very, very biased, discriminatory, targeted advertising. You're making sure that none of the members of S you're advertising to will actually show up. And that's the weakness of group notions. And the point is that fairness really relies on identifying the relevant subgroups for the task at hand, whether that is carnivores in the group S, in this made-up example, or the qualified loan applicants within S, in a real-world example. Okay, so we don't just need to think about S in aggregate as sort of um, a single entity. We really need to be thinking about who are the relevant subgroups, and the groups needing protection might not even realize this. It can be very subtle. Um, Cynthia and I taught a summer school last week, and you know, we had an example by Sendhil Mulinathan of um, where the full-facedness, whether an individual was full-faced or not, became very relevant to an automated classifier. So who would have thought that uh, the thin-faced people were the ones needing protection, but nonetheless, in this example, uh, that is what happened. Okay, so these are the shortcomings of uh, group fairness. And the perspective, or the line of work I wanna tell you about is what we call multi-group fairness. This is work with Herbert Johnson, uh, Kim and Rheingold, and also uh, in a work by Kearns, at all, sorry, I should be more prepared on the names. So the perspective here is let's not just protect the single group S or a few disjoint groups, but all of the groups that we can identify. Okay, so all the groups that can be identified given the data that we have, the features that we have, and within reasonable computational limits. So both the members of S and the members of some other group S prime and the intersection, thinking about intersectionality of S and S prime, um, and the qualified loan applicants in S and the qualified loan applicants in S prime, all of the groups that we can actually identify will be given protections. Okay, and you can think about what protection means. You know, we have uh, different notions of group fairness. The main notion I want to tell you about today is the notion of multi-calibration from our work where we are guaranteeing calibration, so a certain notion of accuracy that I'll define in a minute, for every subset, for every group S, in a very rich family C. And think of this family as exponential, okay? So it's really, really huge. Okay, and you can think about this in terms of a computational bound on the complexity of S. This is really a complexity theoretic perspective on fairness, but let me not dwell on that too much. So what is the requirement from a multi-calibrated predictor? For every set in our collection, which is incredibly rich and is looking at the intersections of gender and race and socioeconomic status and age and immigration status, as we'll see in an example coming up. So for every set in this collection, simultaneously, we want the predictions to be meaningful. And what do I mean by meaningful? Within every group of the people for whom the predictor says, say, they have a 0.9 probability of the outcome, about 90% should actually have the outcome in the end. I don't know what to do about this. It's, yeah, a little better. Okay, sorry about that. So of course, I don't just want to do this for the people for whom the predictor predicts a 0.9 probability, say, of repaying the loan or succeeding in college, I don't know, whatever we're trying to predict. But for every one of the prediction categories, we call these the level sets. So for the people within every group, for the people for whom the predictor says 0 0.1, about 10% should have outcome one. 0 0.2, about 20% should have outcome one. And you get the picture. So this is a strong notion of meaningfulness. I claim, once we're talking about a very rich family, a very rich collection of sets, this becomes a strong notion of meaningfulness for the probabilities. In particular, it means that within the computation class that we're considering, you cannot identify a group that is being, I don't want to say that is being mistreated, but you cannot identify a group where the predictions are sort of meaningless, you know, where we're predicting a 50% probability of returning the loan, but actually 90% within this set are uh, returning the loan. That simply cannot happen. 
That's the guarantee of multi-calibration. So it might look like too strong of a notion, but in fact, we show that it's obtainable. So there always exists a multi-calibrated predictor. There is no tension. You know, trying to be good on one group doesn't hurt the other group. You can, be, you can have meaningful predictions on all of the groups simultaneously. Um, we have a learning algorithm for learning multi-calibrated predictors. I don't want to dwell on it too much. I just want to tell you that the key idea behind the algorithm is to iteratively look for a group that is being mistreated in terms of its, the calibration of its prediction. So try to identify a group and a prediction category, say 70%, where actually you know, not 70%, not 70% of the outcomes are one, and then fix the predictor on that group and iterate. Try to audit and find uh, whether there's another group where calibration is broken. So there's a very um, close-knit relationship between the question of auditing, which I haven't talked about, but is an important question, being able to audit a predictor for its fairness, and the learning algorithm. When the class is exponential, auditing can be hard. There's some hope for using the power of machine learning for doing the auditing itself. Um, but there are, there are questions about computational complexity here, and you can ask me about those in the discussion or uh, over the break. I also want to say that this condition or the algorithm can work as a post-processing step. Okay? So perhaps we have some uh, uh, company doing automated prediction, and the company has artisanally fine-tuned its predictor to its liking. Right? They have the predictor that they've trained and they like, and they don't want to use a new learning algorithm. That's fine. You can start with the predictor and just um, obtain multi-calibration as a post-processing step that is guaranteed to only improve uh, your accuracy. So with that in mind, I want to tell you about a real-world deployment of this. These ideas started deep in the theoretical literature, but we have applied them in the context of medical risk prediction. This is work with Barda et al. Uh, that was done in Israel with uh, the largest healthcare provider in Israel. It was also done with Noah Dagan, who is speaking later in this uh, session. And the goal was to take a look at, at what's happening with the prediction of risk for cardiac events and osteoporotic fractures. So these are life-threatening conditions. And risk prediction plays an important role in prevention and treatment. Okay, so in particular in cardiology, risk prediction has been baked in for decades. You go into the cardiologist and they look at your cholesterol and your blood pressure and various other measures and they decide whether to give you statins to lower your cholesterol or not, for example. That's a, an, a formula that they use um, that is predicting your risk of a major cardiovascular event in the next 10 years, and if the risk is too high, they put you on medication. So we wanted to take a look at these risk predictors, and it's known that classically, tr classical risk predictors from the 50s, for example, were trained on cohorts of uh, white miners in England. Okay, so I believe those are the Framingham uh, equations, of course, you know, they don't predict, predict risk well on uh, women or minorities, and there have been various efforts to improve this by um, running new studies on more diverse data. Um, our goal was to do it not by running a new study and collecting new data, but by applying multi-calibration as a post-processing step to make sure that the predictions are meaningful for all the groups. And we looked at a lot of categories. So actually, I want to say, in the context of what's done in the medical literature, this is a lot. In the context of computer science, it's actually a small number of subgroups. But we looked at the ethnic categories in Israel, intersected with sex, intersected with six age categories, intersected with three categories for socioeconomic status, intersected with categories for immigration status. And I want to say, in Israel, the healthcare system is national nationalized or centralized to an extent that it just isn't in the United States. So you have very rich data about individuals, and you do have all of these features at hand. So for example, we looked at subpopulations of this form. All in all, we have it's actually more than 360 subgroups, many, many subgroups. Um, and we, want, we wanted to see what's happening in terms of the calibration. Are the predictions meaningful? The predictions given by the state-of-the-art modern medical risk predictor, which has already been globally calibrated to the population in Israel as a whole. What's happening for these subgroups, and can we make things better? 
So here's what was happening. This is a plot of, the calibra of a measure of calibration for the entire group. So the groups are on the x axis are on the, uh, in the probability density, and here we have the calibration score. So one is very good calibration. And you see that globally, the calibration is very close to one, so the predictor is very well calibrated globally on the entire population. But nonetheless, there are many populations, you know, the 20th percentile, so 20% of these subgroups are getting a calibration score of less than 0.8. The predictions are not calibrated and risk is being under-reported. Okay, so they, the risk is being underestimated. And we also have groups, if we look at the 80th percentile, where risk is being overestimated for those groups. Okay, so even though this is a state of the art and has been calibrated to the population as a whole, you know, this is really something we don't want to see. Um, and I think it's common. I mean, I'm not a doctor and I don't deal with you know, practical medical data analysis, but I would assume this comes up all over the place. So running our algorithm as post-processing on this predictor, this is the picture you see that almost all, calibration is just vastly improved. Okay, you can never get perfect calibration because you always have essentially a generalization error. You try to train on a certain data, but then you go to the underlying distribution and you have a little bit of training error. And that's normal, but you see the calibration is vastly improved. Almost all the groups are very close to one. A different plot. Here we have all of the groups on the x-axis, and for each group we plotted its degree of miscalibration. So this is on a log scale, so zero means that you're very well calibrated. The groups are also sorted from the largest to the smallest. So the entire population is very well calibrated, and then we have our various groups by size. And you see there are many groups where we are overestimating or underestimating risk. Okay, so that's the situation before running our algorithm, after running our algorithm, this variance in terms of the calibration error was reduced by about 99%. Okay, so that's one case study. What happened here is we significantly improved calibration. I want to emphasize we did not hurt accuracy. Okay, so the positive sense of discrimination, discriminating between, yet yeah, between uh, one outcomes and zero outcomes was not hurt. The post-processing was fairly lightweight. Maybe you can say it's interpretable. We sort of looked at these socioeconomic different groups and we tried to do better on them. I want to mention, I have time, I think, so I want to briefly mention um, a different deployment we had because some of the talks yesterday made me think of it. So this was deployed um, for a totally different um, goal of uh, risk prediction for COVID uh, early in the pandemic. And the point was that we didn't have data in Israel, so COVID, you know, there was a lot of COVID in China, but there were very few cases, uh, less than 10 cases in Israel at that point. And uh, the health provider wanted to deploy a risk predictor for COVID. And the question was, well, how do we come up with a risk predictor when we have no data? And the idea was, well, we do have a little bit of data. We had marginal risk categories from China, from the Chinese population. So breakdowns of risk by sex, by age, by various um, comorbidities, high blood pressure, um, kidney disease, et cetera. No intersections, but just kind of like the aggregate statistics. And this made me think um, of your talks yesterday and also of Nancy's remarks. So there was very little data. And the idea was, well, we do have very rich data for the related illness, for flu, for another respiratory virus. So the idea was to take the very, very accurate flu risk predictor that does know to take into account all these different categories and use multi-calibration to sort of shift its predictions according to the group level marginal risk statistics obtained from China. So sort of saying, well, you know, the flu risk predictor is telling us, you know, maybe there's an average uh, 20, you know, 5% risk of, of uh, adverse outcomes but it lets us know who are most at risk, and we're sort of moving that or we're shifting those according to the marginal risks statistics we got from China. And I was wondering, and I'd be happy to talk about it, whether some of the issues with data that is collect, that are collected um, that only have these marginal statistics, maybe some idea like this could help to enrich the data by using information taken from other sources. So anyway, it was just a thought um, inspired by the talks yesterday. 
Good, so that was um, multi-calibration. The literature has gone well beyond it uh, in the last, I guess, uh, four years or so. So we can now talk about general loss minimization. So not just trying to fix calibration, but essentially any notion of loss where you might want to make sure loss in the machine learning sense. So any notion of misaccuracy or um, some other scoring that you want to give the predictor, we can guarantee, we have a good understanding of when we can and cannot guarantee it for a large collection of groups simultaneously. We can handle very general loss functions. Um, this notion of, so really, I've told you about a computational notion for meaningfulness of probabilities, right? We cannot identify a set where the predictions are miscalibrated. And we built on this, this is joint work with uh, Dwork et al to uh, come up with an even stronger, I think maybe, I think of it as sort of universal notion for meaningfulness of probabilities with respect to the underlying data distribution. That's outcome indistinguishability. There's a question of which sets we are using. Uh, so the sets are playing two roles in multi-calibration. On the one hand, there are protected groups, thinking about all of the intersections. On the other hand, we're also trying for the sets to identify the qualified say, loan applicants within each group or those who are truly at high risk of heart disease within each group. And there, I think this is a really good question of which set should we use and um, who is the first author? Barbakan et al. have some work, interesting work on that. I think Frauke will tell us about universal adaptability and ways um, in which predictors that are trained to be multi-calibrated are robust um, to changes in the underlying distribution or changes in the loss function that we want to use, basically to deployments that might be a little bit different um, from the setting in which they were trained. And I wanted to end there uh, and maybe give Omer a chance to uh, give some remarks. So let me sum up. Um, discrimination is a really hard problem. Um, it can be subtle, it's very context dependent, we have a lot of work to do um, as computer scientists and beyond, um, but we also have some progress. So we have these notions of multi-group fairness, calibration, and beyond. I want to say multi-calibration um, is a notion that's geared towards accuracy with respect to the underlying data. Okay? So we are requiring that the predictions make sense given this distribution on features and outcomes. And of course, there might be problems with the data, Right? You know, the features might not be sufficiently expressive. Um, you know, minorities might be underrepresented uh, in the data. Outcomes might be biased due to, they, outcomes will be biased due to historical discrimination. And so, you know, you might say, and I wouldn't argue with you, that you do not want to be accurate with respect to the underlying data. And I say, yes, we do not always, you know, there are many settings in which we do not want to be accurate with respect to the underlying data. Nonetheless, uh, multi-calibration gives us a good starting point for handling some of these concerns. So concerns, for example, about underrepresentation. I think Frauke will maybe speak to that. Um, you can ask me more, more about this point uh, in the discussion. Um, and some other challenges in this area that I wanted to talk about is, you know, we're talking about the meaningfulness of the predictions. Of course, we always have to also be thinking about what are these predictions being used for? Okay, and how, how might these predictions be used? And in particular, um, what are the consequences of our errors down the line? Um, so I think there are interesting questions there, and maybe Omer can say something about omni-predictors with respect to that. Um, and we've gone beyond this prediction setting to think about complex resource, competitive resource allocation settings, like two-sided matching, so matching students to schools or residents to hospitals, and what can our theory of fairness say um, in those contexts? And I think I will end there, so thank you. Thanks very much, Guy. So why don't you stop sharing the screen? And I think, Omer, you wanted to talk for a few minutes, is that right? I can, I mean, this was so well done that I don't know if I have much to add, but. Perhaps just to the uh, well, last point, um, really we started with multi-calibration trying to, um, to make sure, to deal with 
additional harm. So there is a harm already in the data, but to deal with additional harm that can be caused by the process of learning. Uh, but uh, we see that it actually can be very useful in understanding and, and at times addressing uh, harm in the data. And uh, I think, again, what Frauke is going to talk about is going to be relevant. And, um, and so it, it, there are various ways in which the data can be uh, problematic and more and more parts of it uh, could be addressed uh, using this perspective. And there is even some evidence and hopefully more evidence to come that uh, if we're thinking about um, affirmative action, then uh, to have a fine-grained affirmative action, the right way to do it is first to uh, understand uh, the current data or the current uh, situation as, as finely as possible and to have it on the basis of that. Um, what Guy mentioned in terms of omni prediction is that uh, this, this work has been shown to have a lot of uh, uh, unexpected applications for uh, machine learning. Uh, in particular, kind of uh, a way to um, this notion of only prediction that allows you to uh, train a predictor that would be possible to, to use to minimize all kinds of losses. And that actually also has some uh, potential interpretation in terms of uh, um, uh, addressing data issues. Uh, uh, but um, I think that I will let us keep on schedule and reserve any other discussion to the discussion part. So thank you. Thanks, Omer. Let's thank both speakers again.